Um, welcome to everybody. I'm Claudia Duce and I was invited to chair the Macro Symposium, uh, kind of invitation by the Professor Franca. I am an associate professor from Rontre University in Italy. And uh, we will have this Micro Symposium that will precede the inaugural address of Professor Franca. Uh, the title of the Micro Symposium is The Fabric of Our River Basin Water and Sediment. And the Micro Symposium will be divided in two parts. The first part will be devoted to water, the second part will be devoted to sediments, and both sediment and water are uh, essential elements uh, to be taken into account in river basin management. Now we start with the first talk. Um, the speaker is Bettina Sheffley. Bettina got her PhD at TPFL. She uh, the position as assistant professor at TUDEL, then assistant professor at TPFL. She will be moving in September as full professor at the University of Bern. She is editor of Hydrology and their System Sciences, and she has been in charge of the Kachan Hydrology Subdivision of BGU. Her research interests include hydrological prediction for sustainable water resources management and hydrological processes research based on field work. And the title, the title of the presentation is Predicting Mountain River Resources, Challenges and Chances. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here today. So headlines about the evolution of our mountain water resources are omnipresent nowadays. This is just an example from earlier this year, from New York Times, that says glaciers are retreating, millions rely on their water. These kind of headlines usually come with impressive pictures of glacier retreat and of general numbers about how climate change impacts our water resources. And usually there are always these big numbers about how strongly we rely on water resources. And obviously, glacial retreat is the most impressive ongoing change in our uh, mountains. Here an example of the evolution of the biggest or largest glacier in Switzerland, the Lech Glacier, with simulations from colleagues from ETH Zurich. And obviously, I guess most of you see the, these kind of simulations regularly because they also appear in the mainstream news. And already at the early 2000s, it became kind of a uh, uh, common habit to come up with climate change impact predictions on how the changes in our mountain environments will replicate on stream flow regimes. Here we have an example, mean monthly stream flow plotted against time, where we see in red the observed stream flow regime for a reference period, and in grey some of the earliest climate change impact simulations for this catchment in Switzerland. These are the predictions in grey for the end of this century. And basically many people continue to work on these climate change impact predictions, they find them. Here we see in green, like one of the latest state-of-the-art predictions for these catchments, even if it's already eight years old, it doesn't change a lot. So we see here that obviously there was some progress, there have been changes in what we now think that the future regime will be of this catchment. But when we look at these kind of results for future regimes, what we should not forget is what is actually behind this. So what is behind is a more or less complex modeling change, starting with global and regional climate change simulations that are then fed into some local scale models that are more or less complex, hydrology, land use change, ecosystem change, water management. And what we do with this is, well, we try to put nature into simple equations. And as modelers, we probably tend to sometimes forget what is actually that we put in these equations. And just to, for those of you who are not permanently working on hydrological process, just to recall you what we actually model. Especially in mountain catchments, it's rather complex. Snow or rain falls on, water, on the ground, accumulates, sublimates, infiltrates, creates surface flow, subsurface flow, exchanges with the groundwater, ends up at stream flow, which we can measure, and as evaporation transpiration, which is extremely hard to measure. So 
So now we have complex nature and we have the need to come up with reliable predictions of how our water resources availability is going to evolve in the, uh, in the near future or in the far future. And what is the way forward in this context? Of course, many of my colleagues, especially also in the Delft area, they would probably say, well, one of the solutions is certainly to have even more complex model, to come up with better equations, and to hope that at some point my very complex model will be able to capture feedbacks between all hydrological processes and the, and the living part of the system and the human part of the system and to come up with reliable predictions. Today what I would like to focus on is to actually say well maybe we still should learn more from observations from the past at many places and try to actually understand, first of all, why are mountains so special and what is the actual snow, uh, role of snow and glacier in these environments. So the first example that I would like to discuss is glacial retreat and water resources. So I come back to the topic that I mentioned at the beginning, because especially in the European Alps, glacier play a key role for economics for example, for hydropower production. So I've picked here the example of hydropower production because in Switzerland, that's really a big issue. Glacier retreat is going to impact hydropower production. Just as an example, the numbers switched a bit in this version, but Switzerland has about four cubic kilometers of reservoirs in the Alps to build, to produce hydropower which corresponds to 9 terawatt hours of electricity production, so roughly 10% of the annual consumption of the Netherlands. And just to give another impressive number, 93% of the Swiss territory is in a turbine at least once, which is good news because this means that they have a lot of data about water flowing through turbines. And water from mountain catchments is turbine on average 12 times and up to 30 times before it leaves Switzerland. We also have very good numbers about glaciers in Switzerland. So 2.5% of Switzerland is covered currently by glacier and over the last 30 years about 0.6 meters per year of water is lost or was lost on this glacier surface, which corresponds to 22.5 cubic kilometers of water, roughly one quarter of Lake Geneva. So, what, how relevant is this now for hydropower production? The good thing is that talking about hydropower is that we have a lot of data. We have GIS information on hydropower infrastructure, we have hydropower production statistics. We also have now mass change estimations or observations for all Swiss glaciers. We have natural stream flow for Swiss rivers. We have uh, glacial runoff simulations. So compiling all this information allows us to estimate how much electricity is actually produced per cubic meter of water that uh, results from glacial retreat. So how much electricity we produce from uh, the loss of glacial mass. And combining all this information allowed us to come up with these nice maps of how much electricity we produce from glacier mass loss in the last 20 years. What we see looking at these maps is that in some catchments, so in the highly glaciated catchments, this number can be really relatively high, going up to like several hundred gigawatt hours per year. And of course, we see strong regional differences. Here we see the hydropower production share from glacier mass loss for different regions. So we have the Rome catchment outlet Geneva, we have the Rhine catchment outlet Basel, and what we see is that basically this one region, the Rhone catchment, produces currently up to 8% from its, uh, of its hydropower from glacier mass loss. So that's water that has been accumulated decades to centuries ago and that is lost and will not come back. So, but overall, since 1980s, we can say, okay, it's probably 3 to 4% of Swiss hydropower production that results from glacial mass loss. And the publishing of this number 
led to the only positive climate change impact news in the recent years, which was, well, in the end, hydropower doesn't depend very strongly on glacier mass loss, which uh, some people in the room would have anticipated. But actually, for the general public, it's good to know that now we have a boundary condition. If it's only 3 to 4% in the last 30 years, it's not more that we are going to lose in the next 100 years. This example was to tell you that the reliable quantification of actually available water resources is probably the first important step before anticipating how much we are potentially going to lose. And of course, this comes with detailed communication of the corresponding numbers, and it's of prime importance for the ongoing climate change discussions in the general public or in politics. So the second example is about what is actually the role of snow for summer stream flow. First, just to recall you how as hydrologists we look at the functioning of a catchment. Catchment, a natural unit, what it does is it receives precipitation, it partitions it in different storages, stores it for a while and releases it as stream flow. So basically very simple. As soon as we add the role of temperature on top of it, so meaning snow accumulation, what happens is illustrated here for a high alpine catchment. So during periods of the year there is snowfall, which results in very low winter flow, very high flow during spring when everything is melting. And this interplay creates this typical mountainous regime with high water availability between, let's say, March and October. But now, if we focus on summer stream flows so or periods when we might have droughts in lowland areas and where the snow is mostly gone, we plot here specific stream flow, so cubic meters per second divided by the catchment area to have a comparable uh, quantity. We plot it against mean catchment elevation. And what we see for all undisturbed catchments in Switzerland, so meaning catchments that have undisturbed flow, no hydraulic infrastructure, we see this extremely strong gradient of stream flow produced during summer with elevation. Part of this gradient is obviously explained by glaciers that are currently retreating. Those are highlighted by catchments that have more than 20% glacier. And in general, we have a very strong gradient for uh, places or catchments that have a seasonal snowpack. So the first reaction might be, well, that's the snow. But don't, rem don't forget, we are in the middle of summer here. So Snow should, in theory, have melted already before. So there are catchments that don't have glacier and they still have this very strong gradient of summer stream flow. So what explains this? Well, obviously precipitation. Precipitation increases with elevation at many places. An interplay of temperature vegetation and precipitation also decreases evaporation with elevation. So that's like the part that we can explain or that we might think we can explain. What we do not know is what is the role of groundwater flow and of subsurface storage in this story. So let's have a first look at the easy part. So increase of precipitation with elevation. Here we have mean summer precipitation plotted against elevation. And what we see is, well, this gradient is very strong up to a certain elevation, and then the gradient breaks down. So that cannot be the explanation for strong stream flow gradients. What we can do next is to look at base flow. Base flow is like the minimum of out of amount of water that is always in the stream, even uh, in the summer. And we, we divide this base flow to precipitation. And what we see is again that we have a very high ratio of this minimum flow, which reflects groundwater, compared to precipitation. And so this kind of implies, okay, we have high base flow, which means that we need to have high storage. This would mean storage goes up with elevation, which is rather unexpected for most hydrologists. So now what can we do next? Of course, we could come up with some complicated model and try to explain this. What we chose is to say, okay, we take the simplest possible model to try to get more insights. So the equation that is on the screen is the, a simple analytic Streamflow distribution models initially developed by Gianluca Botter et al. 
And it simply makes the assumption that rainfall is a stochastic input, a stochastic forcing. The catchment censors it, so part of it generates stream flow, part does not. And with this simple assumption, we can now come up with this gamma distribution that explains stream flow distribution as a function of very few parameters, among others, the frequency <coughs> of stream flow generating events and the mean precipitation on days when it actually rains. So what is important to retain here is that with this model, we can explain stream flow really just as a frequency of events and mean precipitation on rain days. And furthermore, we can explain storage, the necessary storage in the catchment as the mean stream flow divided by its recession coefficient, which is the time scale at which it releases water. This model has been successfully applied at many places in the US, in Europe. Here an example from uh, one of my students' work where we see how well the model fits observed data. So we have the accumulated probability distribution on one axis and the log of the observed stream flow on the other. And we see that depending how we estimate the model parameters, we get very good results. In black, the observed one and the other is the model. Just as a side note, the model has already been adapted to much more challenging environments. Here for a result from Müller et al, who adapted it to seasonally dry catchments in Nepal, so completely different mountain system. And we see that it's not entirely able to reproduce observed uh, distributions during the wet season, but it does a pretty good job knowing how simple it is. So now this model allows us uh, new insights on what's different in these catchments. Uh, we plotted here on one axis the frequency of stream flow generating events minus the frequency of rainfall events. And again, again against mean catchment elevation. And so what we see here in this plot is that some of the catchment produce more stream flow events than actual rainfall input during the summer. For glacier catchments, that might be obvious. There is some continuous inflow of glacier melt, but we even have catchments that don't have glaciers that have more streamflow events than rainfall. And if you use this model to explain subsurface storage, we see again the same result as before. Subsurface storage against mean catchment elevation, we see a tremendous increase of storage with the elevation. Again, the glacier catchments this storage might be the glacier itself. But for the other catchments, it's a question, where is, where is this storage actually happening? So this whole story to say that actually high summer flow might be more related to the catchment itself, to the topography, the geology, storage potential, than to, actual, to the fact that it currently snows. And so this story is already, this part of the story is very intriguing, but what we haven't talked about is vegetation. So there's the whole complexity of the, of the question of summer stream flow in these catchments is really made even more difficult to understand because vegetation is coming into play. And what I just explained to you basically shows that these catchments might not, the stream flow in these catchments might not depend on how much snow falls every individual year. Vegetation in exchange, of course, is the next question, the next step to ask, like what happens to vegetation, what happens to summer droughts. Without going into detail, I just would like to mention here, vegetation in mountain areas, that's a completely different story than stream flow. Here we show an example of tracing what water vegetation actually uses. We traced it with stable water isotopes. And this plot here just illustrates that vegetation uses completely different water. So vegetation uses rainwater, whereas stream, uh, groundwater and springs are mostly fed by snow. So this water tracing approach gives us an additional hint that there is something that we really need to understand, which in hydrology is currently called the two water worlds, so meaning that vegetation uses different water from the stream flow. So now that we have these observed gradients, which we are lucky enough to observe in Switzerland because we have all these detailed uh, uh, stream flow observations, can we now assume that Climate warming will simply shift the catchments along these gradients? Probably not. And 
what do we need to do to actually understand how snow affects these gradients? Is the fact that the water falls as snow a key factor? Or is it just the geology and the topography of these places? And can current climate change impact modeling change chains actually reproduce these kind of gradients that are observed? I don't have the answers today, but what I can say is that mountain water resources have the advantage that they are evolving extremely quickly, which gives us the opportunity to actually observe the ongoing change, which is fascinating and which gives us really new ways of observing the potential future by going out and measure the current situation and especially also to dig into existing data to understand what are our current available water resources before making predictions about the future. Thank you very much. for the game, I think. <laughs> so someone has to catch the ball, even if you don't want to. <laughs> okay, I might make the uh, is, is there any... You need to wait it. All right. <laughs> uh, is there any uh, morphological observation that would justify the possibility or that back the possibility of water being stored in the, in the soil at upper uh, catchments? Well, we have, of course, like quaternary deposits that can be impressive. So at, at specific places, we can say, OK, the, the geomorphology and the, the current aspect of the terrain suggests that there is high storage. Uh, what is interesting is that when I present these results uh, currently at ETU, for example, the first reaction is from, so, from some part of the community, that's not possible. And other people like from Russia, Chile would come and tell me and say, we see exactly the same. Uh, so it's it's not for some people it seems surprising. Uh, what our our justification is basically it's a question of the potential uh, the connectivity of the storage to the river. So the higher up you go, the more slope you have, the more easier storage is connected to the river, which explains it's not necessary that the absolute storage goes up. It's just that the connected storage to the river goes up if you go up in elevation. What do you That's easy, that's easy. <laughs> well, that was me, so it, it was a similar question really around is, is there a change in antecedent conditions in the catchment associated with perhaps higher temperatures and, and address uh, melt or different patterns of snow melt in the catchment that would generate more sunlight? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole research branch going on on the question whether snow is more efficient in recharging groundwater than rain. So that to mean it's really the fact that it's the, it's the conspiracy between snowfall and storage potential and connectivity that creates high summer stream flow. And that will mean that if we replace the snowfall with rainfall nicely spread out, that the stream flow would go down. So this hypothesis is still very challenging to test. That's why we do the tracers tests, basically, to try to trace the snowfall amount or the snow melt amount in groundwater. Um, but I think the only solution in this case would be to really resort to models and try to understand what is the effect of concentrated, concentrated melt input over a short period with respect to uh, continuous rainfall input over the entire winter. But this is uh, work to be done. <laughs> no question without the ball. <laughs> Thank you for your story. Uh, so you have chosen a very simple model, and, and it's it's a very important element in your. Uh, your approach, why have you chosen this specific model? Why are you doing so different and simple model? Just the thinking about it. So, usually, I also used to work with slightly more complex models, let's say with classical input output models. 
The reason why I use this one is that uh, you can actually estimate, compute the parameters from observations. So there is no such thing as parameter optimization, etc. It's really a model that you take precipitation and you can compute Com compute in a forward mode the frequency of precipitation, the amount of precipitation. So the fact that it's so simple does not obscure the output in terms of a uh, huge amount of data that you do not know what the quality is and how you estimate the parameters. So that's the main reason. It's really like it's the, the typical first uh, um, first principle approach where you really try to condense your knowledge to like the minimum that you need to explain the behavior. But of course, it's really just the way, it's actually just a filter to have a different look at the data. So the key here is to look at the data more than at the model. Uh, I think I was just thinking, did you uh, consider permafrost? Okay, this is a long term issue, yeah, yeah. but you have also a kind of a short term time permafrost, so the moraines are frozen every year, defrost every year, and release water. So, yeah, we have a lot of permafrost discussions because I'm fortunate enough to be in a at the moment in a university where there are a lot of people working on permafrost. So first of all, permafrost will definitely have an impact on recharge. So where does, how does snow melt or rainfall actually access to the storage? Uh, how this is evolving currently, we are really at the very beginning. What is for sure is that like permafrost, if we talk about permafrost, we really think about the, the systems, the part of the catchment that are permanently frozen. And in terms of the actual water balance, the, the melt of the permafrost has a little impact because it's a few millimeters of water, right? The actual uh, effect of the permafrost on the water balance can be a priori assumed to be small, but it has an effect on the connectivity of the flow paths and especially also on access to storage. And how this, this interplay between retreating glaciers, uncovering permafrost, that's uh, really for the next 10 years, I think. Yeah, but I was uh, also thinking about uh, frozen activity every year. So you have huge mass of moraine, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they froze every year. And they are uh, frozen every year and adding water, which uh, you are looking for. Yeah, okay, so so then this will mean that we are less, then we'll be less talking about permafrost, but ex yeah. uh, about this particular activity. So I just recently got aware that there is a huge amount of research on this question in terms of moraine stability and pressure uh, pressure equilibration between glaciers and moraines. And it, there is quite some knowledge about how much water can be in these moraines in the field of geology on people who work on moraine stability. And this we still have to dig into. Because you're right, that's the, the amount of water that might be seasonally stored in the moraines might be much more important than what we previously thought. Well, let's say that my talk in front of the hydropower people will be in September. <laughs> so I have not had direct reactions so far, even if it was published in the news. Um, what many people would say is, uh, yeah, well, we knew this. And why does this reaction come, where does this reaction come from? It's because in the past, the glaciers were already at, uh, in a more balanced state, meaning that there was, a, there was a period in the past where they produced less water than now. So people could, in theory, every hydropower producer could actually have an estimate of how, of the, its own, of the variability of its system. Um, so the interesting thing is that this number is really so low that uh, some people would say, well, it's still 4%. So in, within the <coughs> energy turnaround objective of Switzerland, it's still a lot. That's a number that I didn't present here, but basically this one terawatt hour that comes from glacier mass loss corresponds also to what Switzerland wants to add in the next 20 years. So from this perspective, it's actually quite a lot. 
Um, but of course, from a, from a production viewpoint, these three to four percent are usually not compared to actual uh, to actual production, but they, can, they are easily compared to other losses. So what other losses do we have for hydropower? A typical one is environmental flow. And there it becomes political, right? And that's why when I actually published the numbers, I, had, I didn't want to get into this, uh, I didn't want to become the one who actually feeds water into this discussion that we should reduce environmental flow uh, requirements because we already lose this water from glacier mass retreat. So if we on top add environmental restrictions, we would lose even more, more water. So this discussion is certainly interesting. And my objective, of course, was not to add arguments on one or the other side. It was really just to say, okay, where are we today? And it's, it's kind of cool because we have, have all this data and that happened has not been combined before. Uh, I already gave the box away. But just one, I mean, I also think it's interesting because it has implications on um, effects over space. So the higher elevation reservoirs are more strongly affected, I guess. Than... Yeah, so that's that's also like the different uh, regions that I showed. They, they, they obviously know already how much they, they depend on hydropower. What is interesting here is that you've seen, I was arguing we should work based on observed data, but then I still have this plot with the prediction, right? And this plot with the prediction where we see that it's going to decrease somewhere in the future, it's, it's interesting because everyone knows that there's going to be something that is called peak water. So at some point we will have more than now, but we don't know, is it already, is it gone? And like the Rhone area, they clearly think that the peak water is not there yet, that it's going to increase for the next 10, 20 years. And the debate at the moment is, the scientific debate also is, is peak water over? Are we in the moment of peak water or is it going to be in 2050? Um, I'm interested in uh, the value you see in detailed models. Uh, we will die from that. Because I would say if, if we try to understand the processes, then uh, we, we can build something that has a sound physical basis. Do you think uh, there is a different way to, to be really predictive towards the future? We do not know or we do not understand it. When I said that many people from Delft would probably go this way, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have said that, it will stay on the web forever. <laughs> it was nothing negative. I just know that I have many colleagues here who work on detailed models, as well as I have colleagues at TU Delft who work also on simple models. So what I meant to say is that in Delft, you really have the entire wealth of, uh, of modeling approaches, there's no doubt. So of course, detailed models have extreme added value in terms of understanding forcings. And myself, I work also with detailed uh, hydro uh, snow process models. The advantage is there that we can really get patterns. And that's the only option, actually. Well, we can use remote sensing, of course. But otherwise, as soon as we're interested in patterns, in how snow melts at different locations, how it infiltrates, we need fully distributed physical models. Um, I just think it's more usual to, when talking about climate change, to go into the more complex model uh, side. So, that's why I think it's always interesting to kind of stay back and take the simple approach, which very often is, which is easy to criticize, say it's so simple it cannot uh, account for the actual feedbacks in the system and so on. I'm not arguing that. No, no, but the I, really no, most yeah. important thing yeah, yeah. I would like to learn is what, what, where is the trade off? Huh? Because if you don't have enough information, it's useless to look at all the details because you don't have the language in which you do the important stuff in. So it's always balancing how much data do you have about the system, how much, how much do you know about the processes, before you step into such more detailed model. Because if, in the end, you would like to be predicting rather than extrapolating the data. So is there a simple rule to, to, to do this? Is it more, let's say, trial and error and see how these your models work and go and take the next step? I think. Very often the, the simple rule is like, if we don't have enough data, we cannot use fully distributed physical model, which I don't think it's the, it's the best approach to take. 
be especially because nowadays that we have exactly we have all these options remote sensing to come up with really fully distributed model with uh, without ground observations okay we're not quite there yet but that's going to come I think what is interesting is really the question of is exactly as you say trial and error there are systems where the there are things that the physical models are extremely good at predicting and for example when it comes to snow hydrology the fully physical snow models they get they give really interesting distributed answers patterns of melt uh, what we see then is then once it enters the soil that's where it becomes more complicated so for the systems that i know the best I, I know where the limit is, so it's exactly trial and error. So we try the fully physical approach. We see what, where, where, how far it goes. It's impossible. I think the the actual answer is like what question you are after, and the simple models they can come up with interesting insights into the average behavior at a certain scale. And as soon as you you need to have access to to patterns or to smaller scale processes, then. The, the, the fully physical or the distributed approach is probably the only one that brings you forward. Is there a need for a completely different question? Because, uh, <laughs> you uh, focus uh, quite a lot on hydropower and the, the economic value of that. Um, I'm, I'm not an ecologist, but is there more value to glaciers than hydropower? I mean, is, is the <laughs> ecological value or the, the ecosystem services or tourism, uh, does that play a role in the considerations uh, uh, or the concerns about glacial retreat? Well, obviously, uh, tourism is the other big question when it comes to glacial retreat because the mountains will be less nice because it becomes dangerous, like moraines that, oops, moraines that collapse, etc. So the, con the main concerns in the Alps is certainly economics so hydropower irrigation also in switzerland we do not much rely on it or not so much rely on it at the moment in other places irrigation is very important then you have tourism and of course ecology except that when talking about glacial retreat in ecology we're talking about recolonization right these are areas that are previously below the glacier so now that glaciers retreat we, we create new ecosystems with potentially new biodiversity but that's something we cannot really argue i mean it's uh the ecological value of what is left behind doesn't exist so far it's going to be built and of course there's a lot of research into this like into understanding uh, what is the role of that but what i would like to point out is that so far we have actually very little understanding of what the impact of glacial retreat is on downstream ecology because glaciers were really studied as systems themselves so for example the interaction between glacier melt and groundwater downstream and biofilms and life that's really just emerging now sorry but i didn't get the slide where you were talking about the different uh, uh, water the different uh, part of the catchment are using especially talking about vegetation Oops. Oh. <laughs> okay, I tried to do something. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I will find a solution to that. I don't know what happened. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, basically, if you could explain a little bit again uh, why you are arguing that vegetation is using a completely different type of water compared to the other uh, uh, components of the hydrological uh, model. Yeah, so. Of course, this was very fast. I just wanted to give like a short glimpse on the other hot topic, which is vegetation. Um, basically, our our data-based results show that well, stream flow is high in summer, and there is no risk for summer droughts in all these environments. And by the way, during the summer drought 2018, it was exactly the case that all these systems didn't have didn't experience drought at all. And the local water manager from my canton even said to everyone, we don't have a drought in our, uh, in our mountains. And at the same time, the farmers called the army to bring water for the cows and for the vegetation. So there is a huge contradiction. And that's because uh, streamflow drought and vegetation drought are deconnected in these environments. We, we kind of know that. We, we observe it, like 2018, we observed it. 
And the deeper reason for that, okay, there is research going on, but one for the reasons is that the vegetation really accesses soil water from the recent few weeks. And that's what we see here, like vegetation is really using rainfall a lot, so summer rainfall, whereas uh, the stream and the groundwater has a lot of snow in it. And this really shows that vegetation does not use the same water as the stream. So the stream has its water from, more, from deeper storage, probably, and the vegetation is fed by more recent water. This uh, triggers a reaction. <laughs> I'm not a plant physiologist. <laughs> okay, thank you very oh. much. <laughs> thank you. Now we move to the second talk that is devoted to sediments. The telephone talk is telling the story of sediment going from provenance to transport, the rule of landscape connectivity. The speaker is Professor Thanos Papanicolaou. He got his PhD from Virginia Tech and got several appointments in the US at Washington State University, University of Iowa. He is professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He is chief editor of the journal Hydraulic Engineering. And his research interests include mechanics of sediment transport, low sediment interaction, hydraulic structures, and instrumentation. Oh, thank you, everybody. Um, let's see here. I appreciate actually for being here today, and what an honor to uh, celebrate the inauguration of uh, Professor Mario Jorge Franga. Uh, I have been very impressed with uh, Mario over the years, uh, his amazing journey, actually. Um, about the quality and, you know, the breadth of your work. And um, um, I'm amazed also looking at your publications pretty much going from the turbulent scale and the micro eddies and the sediment grains all the way to the landscape scale. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, connectivity and connecting landscapes with rivers, uh, challenges and future directions, at least the way I see those. And um, the first thing to do will be, the first thing to do will be to basically uh, define what we mean with the term connectivity. Because for many people, means a lot of things. And what I'm doing here is I'm borrowing uh, the definition from Ellen Wall, a known geomorphologist from Colorado State University, that she's referring, Ellen is describing here connectivity as the transfer of matter, energy, or organisms, in fact, between uh, two different landscape compartments. And today in my presentation, I'm focusing into the upper component of the landscape and also then the stream component. And lately, the last 10, 15 years, we have been talking about the concept of the critical zone. And the critical zone is essentially a cubical control volume where you do have basically organisms living with it, you have water, and you have a lot of biogeochemical transformations taking place, and therefore you are dealing with stocks, and you are dealing also with mass transfers. So one of the challenges with connectivity and understanding really what's going on, the implications of connectivity to mass transfer and how signals of different properties are transporting in space over time is essentially the heterogeneity that there is in the landscape. And you heard uh, Bettina talking about the different gradients that exist in a landscape 
you know, uh, setting. And the other thing that is important to talk is about the lack of connectivity. So those are some of the aspects that I'm going to be talking. So very quickly, uh, we constantly, our community talks quite a lot about the above ground connectivity. But, you know, we tend to ignore and be biased and forget the below ground connectivity. So I'm going to focus quite a lot on the below ground connectivity and also we are going to interface the above ground connectivity and the below ground connectivity with a social connectivity. And again, this is within the critical zone uh, sort of uh, way of looking uh, the things. And just to put things in, in uh, some context for you, in Europe, the critical zone is the soil track community. And in Australia, and other parts of the world is known as the CZN uh, community. So very quickly, uh, a lot of the discussions that we had in the previous presentation were actually uh, referring to above ground connectivity, but also you heard about storage and that relates to below ground productivity. And there a big part, a big component is the connectivity through the porous structure that forms within the soil continuum and we have a network of porous basically a porous network of macro and micro porous and then the social connectivity um, one way is to view it in the form of intensively managed type of landscapes and uh, uh, what we're talking there is, for example, farmers. Farming affects the above ground connectivity when they tile, and they also affect the below ground connectivity because when they tile, they affect the top 30 centimeters, and you change the microstructure, the porosity microstructure, and also you change the compaction in the soil, which affects obviously the connectivity. And then, so that's kind of the social connectivity and how it, it, it comes to my place. So three are the areas that I'm going to discuss. The two of them, connectivity of the landscapes uh, that I discussed in IMLs. The other one is obviously sediment transport and intermittency and few slides on hydraulic infrastructure and stream geomorphology that I'm going to cover today. So this is an amazing picture from um, Washington State. This is right after pretty much in February, right after, you know, they get the snow there in October. And you can see a nice network of uh, reels forming on, uh, you know, on top of that hill slope. And, um, uh, you can see basically um, the parallel formation of those reels and then leading to head cuts and, and so on. And so this is essentially a form of connectivity there. And uh, what we are, you know, dealing here is with intensive managed landscapes. And one hypothesis that we are trying to test is that over the years, due to the social connectivity, those landscapes uh, basically have been transformed from being a transformer type of landscape to a transporter type of landscape, meaning we have affected the landscape so much, the structure of the landscape, in a way that really we have affected the time rates and the gradients uh, of certain processes uh, how quickly with time uh, in a way that this system now basically is not behaving as a transformer but as a transporter and what that means is essentially well that's the reason we're getting at least in parts of the u.s and 
other parts of the world uh, flooding in some ways also that's the reason we see the issues with the nutrients in the Mississippi River Basin and the significant uh, hypoxia that we got in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we have basically um, decimated the ability of those landscapes to deal with basically nutrient assimilation. And the fact that we have changed the structure of those landscapes, we have exacerbated the situation. So this is essentially uh, the hypothesis that we are dealing with and it's a fair assumption to say that those systems are in disequilibrium and uh, that non-stationarity that we see in the behavior of those systems is very much affected by anthropogenic activities. And what we are trying to do here is to deal with um, event-based dynamics and event-based dynamics, I don't mean only extreme, but I mean a sequence of events that we're dealing with. So imagine those are two guys and they're pulling that rope and um, basically kind of the system uh, has become uh, unstable. So I'm gonna deal here with uh, trying to frame my presentation in uh, the form of challenges moving forward and then I'm going to conclude with some ideas where uh, some of us we think uh, there is uh, more room to contribute but also some questions that remain unanswered. And the first thing when um, it comes to modeling those type of landscapes, the critical zone, is the heterogeneity in the properties including land use. And uh, uh, really this picture shows basically the coevolution of, of a bunch of processes. We have a main reel forming um, right here. And then we have five, uh, four mechanisms basically contributing uh, to, I'm looking here, the carbon transport into uh, basically uh, that hill slope domain, we have uh, essentially the replacement of the soil organic carbon through erosion. Then we have, as the transport transports of the particles takes place, we have the burial of that organic uh, matter. In addition to that, we have mechanism three, that's the respiration that is very much regulated from the soil moisture that exists in the soil in the control volume and then we have what we call the formation of the complex organic mineral matter which is essentially when the litter uh, mixes with the soil grains and we have the formation of aggregates which are basically uh, soil clods that form in the landscape. So all of this is very difficult to uh, map in a model and uh, one of the, we got many challenges here and there you go, you got a more complicated model but the challenges in defining constitutive equations that can close really those models is significant and one of the challenges is basically how you can come up with a physical definition for that Cisabel coefficient there, the time lag. And People are actually talking about the role of uh, vegetation, cover, uh, aggregates, and so on. And this is some of the things that we are struggling. Uh, so as we are struggling, struggling with that, another concept that we are dealing very much is uh, the concept borrowed actually from uh, in-stream flows, the concept of uh, virtual velocity and um, how particles are moving and particles in the landscape. And um, that's another challenge uh, that uh, we're dealing with. So um, the other thing that we're trying to understand is how signals of soil fluxes are transported in the landscape so we can 
go and apply remedial measures. Uh, for example, I want to put some terraces. I want to put some, um, you know, name it, grass waterways to stabilize the landscape. Well, I need to know how much migration of mass is transported down slope. And uh, to do that, we are trying to uh, sort of come up with uh, diagrams. And you see there the, on the vertical axis, the stream power concept is utilized and the horizontal axis, the normalized rainfall intensity. And what we're trying to, to understand is basically how roughness, and we're dealing there with a bare soil situation versus vegetated uh, situation where we have vegetation covered, how that signal basically uh, propagates downstream. Um, and uh, one concept that is very known in catchment hydrology, but less, uh, to a lesser extent in catchment geomorphology, is the concept of the crossover point. And the crossover point is essentially the point where a certain signal, here my sediment concentration, on an average sense behaves the same way. So identifying basically that characteristic spatial scale where my signal of mass, my signal of dissolved nutrients, behaves the same will be quite important because then I will know where I can put my sensors in order to be able to assess or evaluate that my remedial measures for that specific water set have an impact to the average flux that comes out from that domain. So this is quite important and it's an example how we can use fundamentals to address basically uh, some, um, in this particular case, monitoring type of questions, but also some societal questions. For example, the decision makers, uh, they want to see is countermeasure A efficient or we need to do something else. So moving on, uh, we, we have and not only us, but we have dealt with a variety of models. We have modified and enhanced um, the water erosion prediction project uh, by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to incorporate some of those issues that I described before uh, regarding heterogeneity and try to route basically fluxes of water, sediment, nutrients, and um, carbon on the downslope. Um, I'm not going to go much into the detail, but you can see how data hungry those models are. And therefore, how much the, the challenges that we got in, in terms of uh, the type of observations that we need uh, in order to even solve a steady state equation for sediment transport. So this is the flux moving down slope in one direction, and this is basically fluxes uh, detachment. These are detachment terms from the real area, and this is the in the real area. And you can see uh, what's going on there. So the, the second challenge is how we can scale up all of this, how we can basically uh, go from the plot scale to the hill slope, small basin and larger basin. And uh, I think an understanding uh, of how the signal propagates in space and time is an issue that uh, remains open. Uh, but also understanding certain thresholds and how, for example, soil moisture we're looking for the soil moisture maps, the map maps that we have in the U.S. to be able to understand, for example, how soil moisture may affect fluxes or, um, you know, uh, transport uh, downslope. 
in the downslope. And uh, this is uh, a, an example of uh, when we put the societal connectivity on top of uh, the critical zone connectivity where we see. This is a very complicated figure, but what we see here is the soil organic carbon in kilograms, kilograms of carbon per hectare. One hectare is 0 0.01 kilometer square um, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis is basically since the early 1900s um, the uh, chrono sequence basically in the SOC. What we see is prior to the or right after the European settlement basically in the US we had about 50 thousand kilograms of carbon per hectare and then once agriculture started basically becoming intense and we had the uh, moldboard plowing taking place uh, we saw pretty much a significant decline a sharp decline in um, basically carbon and that decline pretty much continued until in 1985. In 1985, the U.S. basically had uh, the farm bill that was introduced. And that farm bill basically was saying we need to establish conservation practices. So farmers were given, you know, credits to be able to stabilize, to take measures to stabilize their land and so on. And what you see here is it took about 25 years to see basically the change, to see the reverse, in, uh, you know, slope here in the SOC. So you see a significant change then and pretty much those measures are uh, taking, you know, uh, dividends basically um, but at the same time what you see is that a lot of other activities taking place um, you see that the the farm size also increased in the u.s you have more mega farmers now those mega farmers can buy expensive equipment but also they can do a lot of conservation so you see some of the benefits that we attribute, you know, um, basically the improvement that we see in the SOC, but also we see here this uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, wavy type of plot here is the erosion rates that we saw at different times throughout this period. And then you see after the conservation uh, pretty much uh, period when the conservation measures kicked in, what you see here is that the erosion went below that threshold value here, which is 11 uh, basically um, times the tolerance rate that is uh, set by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, you see basically how all of this, what I call the social, the above and below ground connectivity uh, work together. Challenge three is obviously what is going on at the buffer between the upland component and the in-stream component. And that buffer is the banks of rivers. And understanding this is a topic that received a lot of attention. Um, you know, we have uh, different modes of bank failure and uh, uh, I, I'm not going to get into the details but uh, uh, what's going on in essentially at the bank uh, pretty much the bank interface is the mirror of the rivers as I call it because in many ways pretty much the healthy banks are a reflection of what is going on in the landscape. So 
This is uh, how uh, back in 1966 people, uh, you know, uh, viewed uh, conservation and sustainability of the banks. This is from uh, the uh, from the Iowa River in Iowa City, where I used to be, where basically people went and bought a bunch of old cars and tires uh, to create basically a buffer uh, to stabilize the banks and also to create also uh, areas where you have deceleration of the flow uh, for fish and microorganisms uh, to grow. So we can do a better thing, uh, better than that. And um, uh, one way, uh, one toy that we have uh, sort of worked with is the photoelectronic erosion pips. Uh, they call them erosion pins. And uh, this device was actually stolen from coastal engineering where people will see how waves create erosion and break, you know, near uh, shore. And with the same way, we can measure with those pins here that you see, those photodiodes, uh, you can measure continuous retreat of uh, the banks and uh, you can uh, monitor erosion. But another thing of, uh, you know, importance is essentially the logs and the, uh, those uh, logs can have a multiple, they can have a beneficial, uh, play a beneficial role, they can create those pools, they can work almost like a dam and therefore uh, you can change storage time. This is again from uh, basically from the Illinois River where we see here a picture. Um, so we're talking about um, connectivity uh, and geomorphic connectivity here and enhancers of connectivity and the nick points is one of those. And the nick points pretty much here we are dealing with a nick point that propagates upstream against the flow direction and those are the so-called cohesive nick points in the deep loose area um, and what you see here is essentially the continuous migration of the nick point and the interaction of the flow with the subsurface and uh, you know the undercutting mechanism that takes place. So I'm giving you some uh, snapshots here of uh, the different challenges that we have. Challenge number four is sediment budgets and sediment source partitioning from the landscape. So this is a simple balance equation. My total flux is my upland contributions, my bank sediment, and then this is my channel bed sediment. And um, the next slide is going to show you we are basically uh, trying to uh, source partitioning from where that material is coming from using different tracers. We collect the material at the outlet of a basin or of a catchment here. And we're trying to identify using different tracers like stable isotopes, like uh, radionuclides or even um, you know, clay characteristics and clay mineralogy from where that material is coming from. And what you see here is we are using uh, beryllium-7, that's a radionuclide that has uh, its uh, short life, uh, basically is uh, you get activity up to roughly 45 days. Beyond that point, the sediment has zero activity. Um, and uh, what you see here is uh, two different hydrographs and what you see, the blue lines here, and those pies are signifying contributions of the upland versus in-stream sediment. And you see that at the beginning of the storm, basically have more contributions from the upland because material that is loose ends up into the channel, but as the time 
progresses, you see actually here more material coming, but then eventually, uh, this is an anomaly here, but eventually uh, what we see is more the channel uh, sediment to win over the upland sediment. And then um, here, when we go to a much larger magnitude event, pretty much then in-stream material is winning over the uh, overland uh, sediment. So this is a very interesting, simple technique, fairly uh, cheap to implement uh, that we are using and we have used with success pretty much in about 15 different uh, landscapes. So moving now, this was about, um, you know, uplands and their contributions and now moving to uh, sediment transport and intermittency. One of the problems that I have struggled over the years is basically to understand really essentially what is going on uh, at this lower end, um, pretty much very close to near threshold conditions in terms of uh, fluxes. And we do know that there is some, or at least we agree in our community that there is a universal law that this one and a half power that you see here on the bed shear stress term is widely acceptable. Some people may agree or may disagree, but it's 1.5 to 1.7. And there is some relation there is a, this is a characteristic basically scale, it's a fractal um, sort of dimension in many ways, in my opinion, but what we are struggling with is what is going on in this near threshold type of condition. And there is where we see that intermittency. And what I'm going to be talking today is how um, basically flow intermittency and uh, flow turbulence interacts with bed patterns and bed features and how that interaction generates those features, those emergent patterns that we see in gravel bed rivers, what we call micro clusters or micro bed micro features. And, uh, this is a picture that I have borrowed from Marvan Hassan from British Columbia, where you see uh, those uh, network, you know, that network of uh, patches. Um, this is um, what we believe an organized kind of uh, patch structure. And uh, uh, you see that in gravel bed rivers, but also you see that in uh, sand bed rivers. And uh, uh, you, you see there, you get a, an idea of the, of the um, scale of those what others call reticulate structures. And the hypothesis here is uh, that um, we believe that there are two uh, basically components that drive the whole process. One is the grain to grain collisions that we see in the riverbed and that that's number two there and uh, when grains collide basically they tend to agglomerate so that's one but then in gravel bed rivers and mountain streams that Bettina has talked with uh, essentially what we see is also those boulders regulating uh, the transport and um, I'm going to skip this, but this is a nice, very quickly, I'm going to say that we see those bed features. Um, and this is a bar where you see with the snow um, uh, clearly the exposed, basically, anchor particles. Um, we are trying to understand what's going on around those boulders, the eddy topology and the eddy structure. And what we find is that really submergence around those boulders pretty much dictates what is going on. And uh, the level of the submergence dictates in many ways the area of what we call effective area, what I call the parking lots in the wake region 
behind those boulders and the size of those parking lots. And, uh, but in low relative submergence, due to other mechanisms, we see those parking lots to occur basically in front of what we call the stoss of those boulders. There is a lot of work on that, but this is still an exciting topic and very beautiful topic that I think many uh, young people can uh, uh, discuss. So I was at TU, I am at Delft, IHC and TU Delft, so I thought I should put something about hydraulic structures and I know the, the work that uh, Professor Rutelwald has done and others here in this room when it comes to hydraulic structures. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking basically is uh, uh, to uh, play with uh, interchange of uh, weirs and bandway weirs and understand really how the submergence of those structures affects the location of the scar hole uh, and also the maximum scar depth. Nothing to do with connectivity. Um, so future directions. I think use of sensor technology uh, to develop uh, natural infrastructure uh, for urban communities here in Europe, but also in the US along the coast. Number two is sediment transport and intermittency. This is, uh, I believe, a challenge and with the revolution that we had in geophones, hydrophones, um, RFIDs, this is uh, an area that you all agree we have seen a significant progress uh, the last five to ten years. Um, I think sensors, I'm, I'm dealing again with a band aid type of sensors that you can attach to earthworms and you can get basically temperature what's going on within the soil profile. So there is an amazing uh, uh, revolution when it comes to uh, microsensors. What you see here is uh, the RFIDs, some of the work that I was doing when I was in, in, in Iowa. Um, and how we use them um, around bridge piers to uh, monitor basically uh, scour depth and how we use the signal that we get the radio signal to understand when basically those RFIDs get exposed to water, so scour has taken place, then you see that kind of picky function, it's a Bessel function, but when you are having those RFIDs particles being fully covered with sediment, then you have that bell shape function in your radio signal. And I got, um, more, two more uh, needs. One is, I believe, national and international. In the U.S., we have been moving the large hydropower, but there is now a move the last four to uh, six years with uh, the small hydropower uh, is less intrusive. So one move is to take advantage of about 2,000 dams that exist and need to be retrofitted. The other move is to identify areas that is easy to get permitting going and um, they have also, um, you know, needs for hydropower, for uh, new forms of energy and to use hydropower to support solar or wind energy. So this is another area. Um, well, I mean, one important thing I believe to our work is using satellites and using, basically this is utilization of the MODI satellite in the Mississippi River Basin to get concentration of sediment. And uh, uh, this is uh, basically from data back in 2001, a, a demo where you can see the change in color when you calibrate then the intensity you can uh, basically uh, relate that to the milligrams per liter of uh, suspended material. And I saw a lot of penguins in town, 
So uh, this is actually from uh, a slide that I got from Torsten Wogener, your, your guy, you had him on your... Uh, so, any questions? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for an interesting presentation. I have a very generic question uh, about uh, monitoring networks and the issue of scales. You mentioned that. Uh, it's important to identify that point in the in the scale uh, of uh, space uh, to uh, know how to measure what the, our variable of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe that uh, also, of course, uh, there is the temporal scale, and that may be even more complicated. Uh, can you comment on it? Yeah. So. Essentially, what you saw there was basically over a period of time, aggregated, um, so to speak, ensemble average, um, you know, fluxes, uh, what you saw in, in my plot, in my sketch there. Um, so, clearly, when it comes to the temporal scale, it will be nearly impossible to come up with a framework, so to speak, how to be able to, to say, okay, this is the location. So I believe there, uh, having um, Lagrangian type of approaches, if you can, so there are people that they move with a surge of the, uh, of the storm, and they have those mobile units, like floatable units. Um, so that could be, I mean, just I'm throwing ideas. Uh, but the problem that we had, uh, for example, with a lot of the monitoring assessments was that usually people will go at the mouth of the water set and put a sensor there. And they will say that that you know, sensor is providing rep, you know, representative fluxes for you know, uh, suspended setting. But that was not necessarily the case. Uh, you are not capturing the, you know, variability or the whole uh, range of variability that you had in that water set. So, or you could not, I should say, evaluate what was going on in terms of uh, management practices. So what you saw there is in that slide is from the special perspective coming up with a sort of an average assessment where you should put your sensors so you can capture basically the average response of your water set to a series of events. Thank you. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can go back to your very complicated slides. Or maybe not. Just sure. <laughs> Uh, there's the, in these uh, models for non equilibrium segments or independent species transport, there's these coefficients for the non equilibrium part, which, from my earlier experience on that, become more and more difficult when you get smaller and smaller scales, because then the actual idea of equilibrium, so you're trying to, to, to balance the um, deviation from equilibrium, but then even the concept of equilibrium is kind of faulty in small scales. So, um, are, are you actually following research on that, or would you prefer to, to be more on the side of um, decoupled equations for, you know, entrainment and the position that would not involve any supposition of, of equilibrium in the first place? Yeah. Well, both. <laughs> in some ways, that's an excellent question. In some ways, we have to go with I mean, the current, you know, sort of way of how things are going. And we assume, obviously, there is a transport capacity in a channel, and that's a concept that 
is basically born with that notion of equilibrium. Um, so, and then basically depending on what you, you have, if your flux is greater than that, then you assume that the position takes place. Myself, yes, I prefer to, that we move to that decoupled way. And, uh, but the, the challenges there are we, a lot of our experimental design, in fact, has not been done in a way to, to fully support it. So we got very recently, and a couple of other groups actually I know in Australia, uh, we are looking actually down to basically at the experimental plot, what is going on, using rainfall simulators and trying to understand uh, at the scale, at the grain scale, uh, that notion of the non-equilibrium basically, because pretty much there um, you, you do not have that, uh, you know, you, pretty much you are away from that uh, sort of uh, imaginary, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, view of the equilibrium. Um, and, you, you, and, and, and we see that, for example, um, rains plus is a, an important component uh, when it comes there, but also an untold story uh, that we see more and more is obviously the sealing that takes place in the soil surface and the implications of that. Another untold story is the small head cutting that takes place. That's very difficult to really um, uh, come up with a, sort of a dynamic way to, to predict it because you need to know really your starting point when that took place. Um, there is a very interesting work from um, England by Cooper. <coughs> Uh, at all. Um, that's um, uh, one paper that uh, actually I was very impressed to, to see, believe, has been in water resources research that kind of try to address this issue. Uh, there is uh, a very interesting paper from uh, Louvain, uh, Louvain um, uh, that also tries to sort of uh, address this problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenging, I mean, there is uh, the same issue. I, I had the paper submitted to the Journal of Hydraulic Engineering as a forum paper uh, by Cao from, in China uh, that basically talked about uh, abandoning the, the whole concept of uh, equilibrium, and I think it was published two years ago. It, it, took two four, it, it took four rounds of reviews to get it through and uh, back and forth with AE because you know, there are a lot of deep and hard feelings there about this issue. Uh, but I think as we move more to, from Olerian approaches to Lagrangian approaches, that question becomes um, uh, probably um, more important and also that issue of equilibrium to disequilibrium irrelevant in some ways because with the Lagrangian you follow the, the particle. The feeling is that uh, as, as, uh, it becomes better posed, or at least well posed actually uh, when actually going to Lagrangian um, motion analysis. But thank you. Yep, thank you. So you mentioned that like the systems coming like more transporters and transformers, and then you also quickly said that this might result in the system being more event dependent, event dynamic dependent. So why actually? Oh it's, no! It, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, uh, actually, I didn't mean to imply that. I was, I was saying that we followed an event 
based approach to examine the transporter transformer hypothesis. Uh, so, yeah. So probably it came the wrong way. No, by by any means, no. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Eddie Morse and I'm director of uh, IG Delft. And I'm uh, very proud that uh, I have the opportunity here to announce uh, the inaugural address by, and then I think that's another nice part I wanted to say is uh, Mario Jorge Rodriguez Pereira da Franca. <laughs> I think it's uh, nice that uh, I finally learn all his names. <laughs> And uh, I would like to also very much welcome uh, not only the colleagues here at IG Delft, but also the colleagues <coughs> of uh, the universities that we are participating with, especially today to Delft and Wageningen University and Research. And I would like uh, to ask uh, Mario Franca, as we call him here, <coughs> Professor of Hydraulic Engineering for River Basin Development and Professor of River Basin Development at Delft University of Technology, to give his opening address, which is titled The Changes Here, Fet Faucheur. I think it's your pleasure. So, uh, dear rector of IHC, Eddie Moores, dear professor Wim Houtwell, representing Q Delft, my colleagues of the academic board, my colleagues from the River Basin Development Chair Group, colleagues from Tudel, other universities that came here, dear colleagues, guests, students, family and friends. Thank you for being here today. It's a special day for me. I'm very happy and I'm happy to see all of you. I kind of recognize all of you here, so I'm very happy. <laughs> I will not start immediately my address. So I'm relatively new in the Netherlands, relatively new uh, in this institute as well, although I think I know it well already. So I'll just talk a bit about myself in a couple of slides and then I'll go for my vision or for my, for my address if you want. This will not be a uh, typical speech, it will be an illustrated presentation, that's what I choose for today. So this is my town and I was a teenager in this day, and I got stuck in the flood in the house of some friends. My brother is here, we also got stuck. We both got stuck there for some hours. It was nothing special, it was kind of fun. But I, I think I understood for the, I saw for the first time the power of water and what we have to do to cope with it. I must say I was not very impressed, and I, didn't, I was not very interested by water by then. It was later, as an undergrad student, student of civil engineering, that I went to study hydraulics and fluid mechanics. And I, I must confess it was because I was 
very afraid of the other subjects, so I just decided to go to agile. <laughs> um, and so, but I developed a passion or an interest, at least, for the flowing water and how does it interact with other things, with other elements. And that's my main interest here. I, I did a balance now of my life, so it's not very long, but okay, you always do that sometimes. And I realized that 50% of my professional life was dedicated to research, 30% to consultancy, and 20 for teaching. That's just yeah, the panorama. So the research I did, I noted here not to forget, so it was in turbulent open channel flows, but fluid mechanics if you want, sediment transport, gravity currents, river structures, dam break, and non-conventional hydropower. In terms of consultancy, I did lots of river engineering, hydropower, hydraulics, dam safety, emergency, emergency planning, and many other things. And as a, as a teacher, well, as a lecturer, if you want, I gave the basics of fluid mechanics and hydraulic engineering here, here also for some students. But I also, I also taught fluvial ecomorphology, numerical and experiment, experimental methods, among others. So in all these things, I touch upon several topics. And I like these movies because they illustrate more or less they are short clips, some of my research, not all of them, but some of them. And that's flowing water and interacting with, with elements. Here we have a brine current intercepting uh, an ambient fluid. So it's a salty current going into a fresh water current. There we were studying with quick forgetter, which is here, and I'm happy it's here, uh, vegetation, interaction of vegetation with the flow. And here there are two studies on bed load transport, um, or I'm sorry, on sediment transport, bed load and suspended transport. This allowed me a great interaction with many other specialists like microbiologists, fish behaviorists, entomologists, ecologists, lots of people with whom I was happy to work. I still didn't work how the flowing water intersects with humans, for instance, or legal aspects, economical aspects, health and defense. And I would like to do it, so it's an invitation. And finally, I just want to, for a, a lighter slide, I have a connection with Delft, so I'm not that new to Delft. I don't know if people will still remember me, but I was here some years ago. I was a master's student of Hauk de Vriend, Professor Hauk de Vriend, and I had a mentor, which was Fred Hafinga. And um, I did a, a master thesis modeling the river Val with a, uh, with a model, with an American model named Sovek. I think this is very familiar to most of you guys, <laughs> all these names. So I'm, I'm acquainted with these things. And for the students, I was also staying in Caesar Frank's strat, so it's not that traumatic, okay? <laughs> it can be traumatic, but we can survive and have a, a nice life afterwards. I must say, I'm going to refer my brother again, because he stayed there some nights as well, and I think we, well, it was traumatic, but we, we could survive. <laughs> and finally, my address. And it has a kind of, um, you know, Alf, English, Alf French name. I also I, I like the French language, and uh, but it has a reason also. I don't know if you are gamblers or not. If you go to a casino and the guy that handles the roulette, when he throws the the, the balls, he, he says "Fait vos jeux, rien ne va plus," which it means basically, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Now it's everything is unforeseen. Let's see what's happening. Okay, just make, make your bets. Okay. Yeah, typically they say it in French as well. I think here they also say it in French. And this is also to relate a bit with the reality. It seems that we go we went through the tipping point already. So we don't know how to handle what we are seeing in the news every day. And I'm talking about climate change, of course. It seems there is a cascade of events with news every day or every week at least that makes us a bit puzzled and not knowing what to do. At least I'm like that. There was a very nice uh, piece of paper in the New York Times in February called Time to Panic. And it was very nice because the author says, maybe panic is our salvation. I don't know. But maybe it's a catalyzer of change that we need. I don't know. But let's go through the rest. And this is more or less the panorama of the, the last century. In 1920, H.G. Wells, I don't know if you know him, he has a very nice book called Outline of History. It's very beautiful, very nice illustration. It's a bit his vision about history. And he referred, let me repeat, that there was the possibility that humans can change irreversibly the climate. And he referred specifically to deforestation that was happening in the States. It's quite curious. Last week, there was a paper from some guys in Zurich calling about forestation as one of the possible tools still to uh, hold on the, the temperature rise. 
so it's not in how we were kind of stuck and not doing nothing. And last week, the UN report said that every week there is a major disruption, disruption I'm sorry, with consequences to human lives and uh, lives on the planet due to climate change. So I think we are there yet, and we see this kind of uh, news every day, right? This is a particular one that I was interested. It was very interesting because it was about climate apartheid. So apparently, those that didn't contribute that much or nothing to climate change, they will suffer the most because they don't have ways to defend and, uh, and they're also in areas more susceptible. Of course, there's good news, there's a growing concern. Uh, I think for the primaries in the, the elections of the Democrats, they discussed uh, climate change a lot. In the last European elections, there was also, it didn't influence the results, which is nice to see. And there is also, of course, the climate strikes from well, the young generation. That's the context of where you are now. So what do I do? I'm an hydraulic engineer, I know about fluid mechanics, and there are some things that at least they are certain. These are the Navier-Stokes equations, these kind of things that we work with. And I think, I hope my students recognize them immediately and know what to do with them. This is one of our main tools. They are simple equations, they just express the rate of change of momentum, and I'm, I'm really not to say something wrong, <laughs> of the flowing water air as a response to external forces, right? And typically we model them, and we simplify them, we cut here and there, and we assume that's the only way we can solve it, otherwise it's impossible. But the, the basic principles, they are still hold, they are still valid, fortunately. What may not be valid is the models that, and the assumptions that we are taking, <coughs> because things don't work anymore, so the simplifications we do may be not be valid anymore. And that's again the, con the context where we are living. One of the things we, did, we do, usually, we do simplified constructions of our life. Very simple things. That's the only way we can handle these complicated equations. And typically, one of the simplifications is related with scales. When we model a river, a river reach, as a river engineering, for instance, uh, we are concerned about the scale of the river width, some hundreds of meters of length, and that's all. And then we just simplify. This is our mean scale, this is where we are. And then we have the large scales, and we just say that's boundary conditions. That gives us the amount of water, amount of sediment, but we just say that's what they give us. And then there are lots of small little things happening in the river, like the water around the pebbles, the pebbles moving, the, the interaction with the banks, and that's the small scales. And what do we do? We say, well, it's a, man a manning equal to something. We just model everything in one number. But the assumption is that what's happening in the clouds, the, the big boundary conditions, don't really intercept, or are separated from the small scale phenomena. And they are two different worlds, and we are in the middle, and we model them like that. But when we watch cascading effects, effects that we watch now, and the climate is apparently is changing everything, things may not be like that. And that's where, where we have to be prepared to face influence on all the elements, and we cannot look at the river and at the sky separately anymore, like the gnome over there. Recently, in our specialization, Alessandro Crossato uh, supervised an excellent student, Alberto Vicetti, I think she agrees. And he, among others, he, but he approached both. So we looked at the influence of changes in hydrology, the big things, how that could affect morphology of a river, and he also looked at how the climate influencing the vegetation could affect the, the, the river, and how this combined. I think I said it right. Okay. So that's one way to go. With all these things, we as a researcher, we are invited to do something meaning, meaningful. Maybe, maybe, maybe finally, right? If we see, if we open the the funding agencies' pages, if we read the news, the politicians, they force us to do something meaningful. It doesn't mean that it's not fundamental research. It means that we have to be thinking about some something that provokes what we call society challenge, uh, societal change, transformation for the human, uh, for the well-being of the humans and of the planet. So, how do we do that? Well, we have to take some guidelines and references. This slide here shows uh, an interpretation of the Sustainable Development Goals, which, for those who don't know, it's a call for action from the UN 
for the improvement of the well-being of humans and the planet. And it's a call for action that, well, establish some targets that we should try to achieve until 2030 to things go in the, in the right way. And this image from the high panel from UN World Bank on water shows the relationship of the 70 SDGs and water. And I really liked it. And the colors show how much they are linked. And then we did an exercise in the river basin, uh, river basin development chair group recently to see how we relate with them, with the SDGs. And we conclude that we are working within the SDG 6, which is about clear water and sanitation. And we are working on about the quantity of water, maybe. On SDG 7, and we are working indeed in sustainable and well, hopefully harmless hydropower generation. We are working also on SDG uh, 11 somehow, mainly on geomorphology, stability of rivers, for instance, for protection of persons. And we are working on SDG 15, on the geophysical features of river habitats, for instance, on how do, the rivers are healthy in terms of variety and biodiversity. We contribute to them. Let me talk a bit about the topics of research that enthusiasm me, if you want, or I, I want to follow in the next years. I divide them thematically, and they include water, land, sustainability, and energy. And they will have several degrees of usage, if you want. I will, be, I will pursue, as I've been done a lot uh, lately, fundamental research, very scientific level, but also, I hopefully, in the applied level, near the application towards solutions. They also be, however, orientated to contribute to some societal positive change. In this slide, I'm talking, the context is desalination plants. Maria Kennedy is not here today. I just want to tell her she knows about desalination plants, if she's hearing me in streaming. I don't know nothing about desalination plants, but I know a bit about gravity currents. And I've been reading and informing a lot, and the, after the desalination plants, which are a crucial tool to fight the lack of water in some countries, and it's going to explode in the next years, but the outfall of these desalination plants is salty currents that are introduced in the environment. And I've been studying the density currents, but never in this sense. But it's known, for instance, in my, my, I think it's Miami Gulf, in a paper from Ben Hodges, he explains very clearly that outside these outflows, the, the, the dense uh, fluid stays stagnant and provokes hypoxia in the end of in the, in the I'm sorry in the bottom of the rib, of the ocean of the east in that case. So with Maria Kennedy, with David Faraz from WSC Group and with Daniel Valero, Valero we are trying in uh, forcing and try to make an integrated model of these flows and approaching the, the pressurized part of the flows and also the outer field and trying to see if there is any operation measure that we can help to solve this problem. It's a very fundamental investigation, but I think it has a clear uh, societal impact. Sediments is something I've been working lately a lot. And why sediments? You know, when you go to a river, we don't even notice sometimes. There is some river, there is some sand in the river, some gravel. But they, they are the builders of the landscape. They are essential to, for riverine habitats. They are essential to bring nutrients to produce uh, food. They are essential for fluvial connectivity and for the stability and safety of the rivers. And with Alessandro, in the front of his PhD, Alessandro Catarpan, with Paolo Paron, Michael McLean, and also with the University of Lyon, Piaget, we are trying to develop a river basin model that represents or simulates the fluxes and pathways of sediments in a river basin. And that's if we have that model well, fine-tuned and running well, we can simulate things with them, like human interference, how does it influence the, 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 sediment, uh, the sediment cycle in the river basin, or for instance, we can help defining protection, preservation and recovery measures of landscape, even dam reoperation, dam recommunition or rewilding of rivers. Hopefully, we can get a tool like that. Another topic it's sustainability of hydraulic infrastructures. <coughs> um, and mainly, I'm talking here about water storage and supply. And 
I use an example, which is the reservoirs that we construct, that, well, the dams that we construct and have a reservoir uh, behind them. Like it or not, we use them a lot to water supply, food production and energy production. And we are using it now, probably. However, they are susceptible to sedimentation. And sedimentation accumulates upstream like that, sorry, reservoir in tai Taiwan, and it lacks the sediments. <coughs> will lack um, downstream. I think we didn't preview water, had you? <laughs> it was an error, <laughs> that's okay. <coughs> it's getting better. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we know already existing techniques to bypass and put the sediments downstream. They are not perfect, we know it, but they're existing. But why don't we apply them? And it's all, all a question of how we make, we have our economical model of reservoirs, for instance. We admit that they are exhaustible resources, and I'm talking about the loss, the storage that is lost upstream, but also the lack of sediments in the habitat downstream. So how do we do this? I've been talking with George Anderdale, some of you may, may know him, he's a specialist in, in reservoir sedimentation, sustainability of reservoirs. Thank you. And, uh, yes, it's there. And, um, and we, we would like to make a global analysis, and just to see in the world if we treated this resources with a scarcity rent attributed to the storage of the reservoir and also to the loss of the habitats in the economical model when you do these calculations maybe it will be worth to apply these measures so this is an idea we're trying to develop and i think a, a good global analysis could change a lot and make this implementation impasse go through to ensure more sustainability of our infrastructure Regarding energy, first we are trying to establish a cross-cutting initiative on sustainable hydropower here. We try now to establish it, now well, we need some more momentum. And that's what we're doing uh, with Miroslav Marens from RBD group, but also with um, Suzanne Schmeier from Water Governance. And we try to make a, a, a forum for discussion and formation of events in this, in this topic. I think the analysis is the right place, because we're kind of neutral regarding hydropower. Uh, generation in, in, in big dams. So I think it's, it's a good place for that. But besides that, me and Miroslav, we've been trying to develop some research line in the development of low carbon and low cost solutions to produce energy. One of these solutions is what we call the recirculation of energy in, in, in the hydraulic, in existing hydraulic infrastructures. We discussed this option last year in World Water Week in the session. It went very well. I think it was well accepted. And okay, and people are working on it, but it seems that we, we miss a global analysis. Again, if we have a global analysis and we show a huge potential in a region of the world, maybe investors change their ideas regarding this. There is a huge potential for energy mining on existing hydraulic infrastructures, on urban and rural, rural spaces, but this hidden treasure and fortune is not well evaluated yet. That's why I decided to make an example here. Make a, small example. This is San Francisco in the States. I don't know if everyone knows this city. Uh, probably not. If you've seen the bullet with Steve McQueen running the streets with the Ford Mustang, it's a, it's a good, you, you know well, San Francisco. And you, you, you understand the slope that is in those streets, right? So I just did a small exercise in this street. So this street, I'm sure there is a water supply network inside, of course. But the, the pressure that the water has on the top of the street cannot come all the way until down, so it, it will just destroy our taps inside, the, inside our houses. So we have to destroy this pressure. We have to get rid of energy. So the exercise is like, I imagine that there was a, about 100 persons in the downside of the street taking a shower during my inaugural address, more or less one hour. <laughs> and I just <coughs> compute the energy that, of what that means. And we could go to Paris and come back in an e-bike. It's okay, it's not bad. That will be the, co the carbon cost of a passenger to go to Paris in train. That will wash 100 kilograms of laundry. And, but unfortunately, all, less than 10%, it will feed less than 10% of a concert of Rolling Stones. They spend a lot of energy. But okay, it will be a contribution. So, IHE dealt we learned this when we came here, we have three pillars. The first I've been talking about, I've been talking about research. The second is education. 
And the third, it's institutional strengthening. Before jumping into the, the two other pillars, let me show you a picture that I produced, very simple of course, but based on Scopus, which is a more or less good uh, source of knowledge um, uh, about what is being published in the world. So if we look for papers with water in the title, I counted, uh, you see how many are published per day, okay? So until now, in, in, in numbers of 2019, we are already in 129. I think we are about 130 academics in the institute. So Eddie will go, have to go every morning, see and distribute by us one paper so we could digest it. <laughs> so the production is huge. It's, it, everything is changing fast. Everything is growing fast, the problems, but at the same time, it's everything, we, we are producing a huge amounts of, of information in non-codified <laughs> uh, manner. That means that in scientific language, so it's not getting to a normal practitioner yet. So what does that mean? That it's not very easy and we have to maybe uh, understand new forms of teaching or creating water professionals or a drug engineers. So that means that, and this is my view, people coming out from schools like ours, they have to be able to produce their own science. Okay? They have to have the instruments, they have to have good knowledge of the basis, but they have to be open to apply the scientific method. They are out there in 20 years, 15 years, there is something different because they didn't learn it here, things change, and there is lots of knowledge Either they know how to interpret it, or either they have to produce it, or either they, or probably they have to do it both. And this is, I think I did a parallel with the, called the emancipation of the spectator, that uh, Jacques Ancier talk. So we need an emancipated community of engineers, and that's what we need. That people that are capable of changing every day, or changing every five days, and acquiring new information, treating them, and providing new solutions. <coughs> Regarding institutional strength, those words are there that in a context of global change, risk management is easier for nations, companies and even individuals when the likelihood and consequences of possible events are readily uh, understood. This is from, I just took this from the last report from IPCC and I think it says all. So it, we have to do the same regarding our institutions. They have also to be sufficiently malleable to accumulate changes and adapt. And I think two premises are essential for this effective strengthening process of institutions. One is identification and another one is independent implementation. And I think both uh, help to have a long-term effect on, on these institutions and that they are capable of adaptation to change. That's my view. I'm leading a project called El, 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 I'm sorry, S Multistor, which is an initiative for research and innovation in collaboration with partners in the South, and it's supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the, in the programmatic cooperation with IHG Delft. And this project, with this, we want to investigate and demonstrate improved tools and approaches that help to have sustainable water storage structures for supply, water supply, food and energy production. So basically we work, we support local partners to develop their own tools and, that, and policies regarding aspects of sustainable hydropower uh, dams and multipurpose dams as well, irrigation and for supply. So the project focuses on three large bases of the world, in the Magdalena Basin in Colombia, in the Zambezi Basin, the middle, and in the Irrawaddy Basin in Myanmar. In the Magdalena Basin, Gerald Corso, I don't know if he's here, is giving you great help with Escuela Colombiana de Ingeniería and Pontifica Universidad Javeriana, local NGOs, administration, civil society organizations, and through PhDs in master research and master students' research. They are able, they are, provide, they are constructing hydroinformatic tools for integrated and sustainable management of storage of water and hydropower, including the definition of environmental flows. Hopefully there will be some good result there. Regarding Zambezi, among other developments that we have there, I refer to the one I was involved more in November, or well, 
through some months, and that was with Gretchen, Tibor, uh, Gretchen Gettel, I'm sorry, I'm saying all the, the same names, Tibor Sikton, Barry, Barry Gersonius, the University of Eduardo Mondland in Maputo, local NGOs, administration, and also with the help of mass students. We did an integrative study of the sustainability of small-scale storage uh, solutions. And we studied them from the point of view of safety, security, structural safety as well, water quality and future resilience. We have a new master that hopefully will produce an integrative view of this. Finally, in the Irrawaddy, in Myanmar, John Connolly, with colleagues from Yantong Tech University, Myanmar Maritime University, local NGOs, administration bodies, and also with the help of PhDs and uh, master's research, we are trying to do a push to the establishment of environmental flow policies and also of guidelines for the improvement of fish migration policies in Myanmar uh, regarding hydropower dams, multipurpose dams, and so on. We will have a workshop in September where hopefully, well, we will we'll, we'll define the framework, the, the first framework for environmental flows in Myanmar. And finally, an extension of this project in Gujarat, India, with Micha Werner and Tibor Sikter, and local administration and a master's student, we did an extension of the project to study strategies for conjunctive water allocation from reservoir and groundwater to increase the resiliency of an irrigation system in an area very affected by droughts. That's a nice picture from the end of the River Magdalena. It has a lighthouse, which is a, uh, which a kind of a reference in a, in, well, for some of us, I think, at least. Just before I phrase my wish list, I don't call it a vision, I just call it the wish list. It's the next slide. And it's, I think it's something that maybe, okay, in some years, we will all be here and you will judge me if I did something or not of what I said. So my wish list is, I hope, simple enough so I can do something. And it's also related with what I, what I have been doing, more or less. So first is the quantification of how human interfere in the natural aquatic systems in those topics that I referred. And of course, with this quantification to contribute towards future-proof sustainable options for this interaction. If we need to take energy from nature, and we need, there's no other way, we shall, we shall do it sustainably. But we have to understand, quantify what we are doing when we extract it. The second wish list, it's contribute to what I said, to the levels of independence and emancipation of the water professionals and hydraulic engineers that go to the course of this school. I think I will hope to be able to do that. And I think in our group, we are trying to promote some active learning and their skills. Okay, let's see if they work. And finally, I didn't discuss this with Eddie, but it's my wish list. But <laughs> it's to help IG transform IG in an international center for water professionals from both or the three or four types of economies existing, I think there are more than two, and that they can meet here and we jo produce joint knowledge for the global water challenge, which touch everybody. This is a nice slide for acknowledgements. I don't know if my kid, Tiago, is in the tent. Do you remember this photo? We were in the boat doing canoeing. It's in a river in Portugal, in Mondego. We had a very nice day. That's why I went to use it for acknowledgements. So first, I want to uh, uh, thank you all, colleagues, friends, and family for being here. I also want to thank, if there is someone following in streaming, thank you for following. I think I have to say this, without funding we cannot do nothing. And I was very lucky all, all my career. I was supported by first to do my master thesis, PhD, and postdoc. It's impressive. By the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. I never paid for study. I'm very lucky to the Swiss National Founda Science Foundation for my part of my PhD as well, and also for projects that I collected later, to the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment and Energy, to the European Com Commission, and then to the Global Partnership for Water and Development between IHE Delft and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and among others that I may have forgot. I want to thank Claudia Dushi, Bettina Sheffley, and Thanos Papanikolaou, that provided our symposium before, our micro symposium before. Thank you for having come. I want to thank Rui Fugair and Neil McKinnon for the review of, this, of the address that was published yesterday. Thank you very much for both. Another reviewer of the, of the address was Carmelo Juez. He has been a very good colleague of mine. 
he got married three hours ago, so he <laughs> couldn't come. I want to thank Anika Carson for organizing this, and Neef, Neef again for helping. And I want to say some words. I was not, I was born in seventy five, nine months after the revolution in my country, and we became when we became democratic. I think I was in a very rare, progressive moment of Europe and my country. I was blessed with the socioeconomic conditions that allow me to build an engineering experience, develop a scientific career, all in an environment of peace, security, tolerance, and freedom. And I would like you to keep it like that. I, like, I wanted to say this, this, this image. And I want, to thank, I want to thank the most important thing in IHE, <laughs> which are the students. I'm glad that they are there. And I think if you ask any one of my colleagues, usually people say this, the best is the students. <laughs> okay? So thank you all for, for existing. I also want to thank my chair group, which is there. Even Paulo, I could fit you there. I don't know if you... You are there in the photo. I don't know if you okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say thank you if we would say that. And I wanted to say the final words. So I've been held in admiration IG and QDEL since more than 20 years. And this is true. Through personal contacts and seeing the research that they do. So since my time as Erasmus Exchange student here, I was very impressed with EPFL. And I always look at it, IG and QDEL. I said EPFL. That was <laughs> I'm glad Tony Schleiss is here. Okay. <laughs> so I want to say it's very... To, extreme great personal satisfaction that I'm here today to say this word. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor uh, Franca. And uh, I think the, the wish list was, was very nice. I think uh, we also very much appreciated that you were able to give us a short course in the Navier-Stokes uh, equations. A crash course. Crash course. And uh, you ended up by explaining how we could uh, progress actually uh, using water to improve uh, society. And I think uh, to do that, <coughs> what is very important is uh, collaboration. And I would like to stress again uh, that uh, your position here at IT Delft is a similar position at uh, TU Delft and I think uh, this collaboration and with IC Delft and other universities uh, in Netherlands is uh, very important that enables us actually to do something like this and I think you're a very nice example of a person who is also working on this collaboration and I think you can't do something without your family there so I'm also very happy that uh, your family is here today to witness this and I think you need friends, and I do think that students are something that start as a student, but it ends up as a friendship. Yeah. So yeah. I think in that sense it's also very nice. I think that if you do that, you also have to have informal occasions, and I think we had a formal occasion at the moment, but I would like to invite you also for the informal occasion, and that's the downstairs in our restaurant. But before we go there, first of all, I would like to hand you flowers. <laughs> Yes, and I know you forgot the flowers on your wish list, uh, but uh, I know you forgot the other parts as well. I also know that uh, Mario has one other thing he wants uh, to do, or let us hear or know, yeah. and uh, then we will leave in a cortege. So some final words, and I, I will leave here something, and then we, we, we can go away. We, we <laughs> but it says, you know, when I compromise myself to do this, maybe February with Anik, I think the first time we talk, you know, we all have lots of plans to do. I failed a lot of them. I will not tell which one, <laughs> besides growing again, but okay. <laughs> and, then, and one I failed two days ago, because I was extremely tired, and I failed the concert of Neil Young in Amsterdam. <laughs> So I don't know if you know Neil Young, he's a very activist for climate change. So I will leave you, I think, yes, with a small video from Neil Young singing Save the Planet for Another Day. So thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe yes. Stop it, my own.